Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee. Al monte que Jesús les había señalado. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Ahayal, ningal purapattu poi, sahala jadihalayum, sisharaki, bautizandolos en el nombre del Padre, y del Hijo, y del Espíritu Santo. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Amen. Are we not blessed with incredible worship at this church? The choir and the orchestra. Um, I had to write that anthem. Anthem's beautiful, that line, teach me that nothing offered you is ever truly lost. Just caught me this morning. So good. Well, good morning. At the onset, I have a confession for you. I am wearing a tie on casual Sunday. I'm just not going to apologize. I rarely get to wear a tie. I do have donuts on my socks, so maybe that's casual today. But it is, uh, it is, if this is the most rebellious thing I do as senior pastor, I feel like we're going to we're gonna be, we're gonna be okay, and it's a joy to be here on a Sunday that I get to talk about the Great Commission. I, um, I love the, the Great Commission. I, I love, I don't know if you know this, but Harvest and Traditional, uh, these two worshiping communities, we're sharing the same series. I haven't figured out how to sneak out of my own sermons to hear Bob Hayes. I've tried, but, um, but I love that we're, we're doing this series, because the Great Commission, it's my, it's my life verse, my life ministry verse. I was 10 years old. Uh, I, I've shared this in the harvest, but I, I want to share it with you. I was 10 years old, the very first time I, I ever learned the, the Great Commission. Um, I grew up in a little bitty church in Marshall, Texas. Uh, it, it was pretty large. I mean, there were 25 in membership. Um, <laughs> Port, Port Caddo Baptist Church, uh, they were faithful, I'll tell you that. And I was 10, I was at vacation Bible school, and, and I remember this like it was yesterday. Because my vacation Bible school teacher, she put a, a lot of uh, memory verses, she dumped them out on the table, and she said, here's the assignment for VBS for your class this week. You're going to learn a memory verse, and at the end of the week, you're going to recite it in front of all of your family and friends during the closing ceremonies of, of VBS. Now, I remember my friend Joey, he lunged for Jesus wept. So that was off the table <laughs> right away. Joey, love him. His bar was really low. I was, I was looking, though, for something. I don't know what this says about me, or maybe I do. I, just, I wanted to just really impress people. So I was looking for something that was big. I wanted something that had some meat on it. And you can imagine the one that I grabbed was the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. And I went home, I took that home, told my parents, can't talk, went into my room, closed the door, and I started just putting it to memory. Now, now here I am, much later in life, it is still seared in the beautiful King James Version. I was going to stand in front of the assembly. I even worked on these hand signs with it. So in my mind, this is the way it was going to go. I was going to take the pulpit there at Port Caddo, look at the 22 people that were in front of me and say... My memory verse this week is the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, where Jesus said these words. <clears throat> Go ye therefore into all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all things whatsoever, for I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the age. <laughs> Amen. Now, yeah. <laughs> See, and in my mind when I rehearsed it, that's exactly what I thought would happen. Confetti guns would go off. My, my parents would be weeping on the front row. And then Billy Graham on a white horse would just come in the back of the church and right up to the front, extend a hand, lift me up, and, and we would go on an evangelistic nationwide tour with the Gaither vocal band leading worship. <laughs> Maybe the Happy Goodmans. I'm dating myself. But here's what, here's what really happened. That sounds great. <laughs> what really happened 
was I stood, I got up there. Mom and dad, they said I had a real solid start. I, I said, I said, my memory verse this week is the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, where Jesus said these words. Go. <laughs> Go. That was it. Apparently, I shouted go five times. Someone in the back of the church just took a cue, got up and walked out. We went down to 22. But you know what I, what, what I, love, about the, what I love about that is that, I mean, there, there I am. I'm 10 years old, right? And, and I put that memory verse, I put that memory verse in my mind. But, but, but what I love is, is here I am a little further down the road. But that verse is a life ministry verse for me. The Lord hasn't released me from those words. Because here's here's why I want to start Senior Pastor with a series called The Great Commission. Because my my fear is the great commission has become the great omission in the church today. My fear today is the great commission has become the great omission. So my hope, my plan, my, my, my passion as I serve alongside you is we would flip that and the Great Commission would become our great obsession. So here's where we've been with you. We have talked about the what. What is the Great Commission? We have talked about the why. Why is the Great Commission important? So what I want to do today is do a little bit of work and unpack the where. Where are we called to take the Great Commission that Jesus has given to us? Where are we called to take it? I have a a sneaking suspicion that really Where we're called to take it is just on the other side of our comfort zone. So a word for two different types of people today. There there may be someone in this space. There may be someone that's watching online. Online is just incredible. I I love that people just, just find us. I don't know how that happens, but they find us. Look, you may be in this space today. You may be watching online. And I don't want to make the assumption that you have professed your faith in Jesus Christ, that you have invited Jesus into your life. So I I want you to know that God is for you. My my prayer for you is that you would come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm praying that for you. We're praying that. People are praying that for you right now. But for those of us that have invited Jesus in, for those of us that have a relationship with Jesus Christ, this is our commission. This is our commission, right, to make disciples. So I just, I, I want to I pray today. I want to pray before I get into the word that the Holy Spirit would just open our eyes. I, I think that anytime we open up the word, anytime we talk about, you know, the spiritual forces of wickedness, the way the enemy just wants to contort and distract and twist, that I think when we're talking about freedom, and today is very much about freedom, I think the enemy wants to distract us. So I, I always love just to say a prayer before I get into the Word. So would you join me in just a, a word of prayer right now? Gracious and loving God, I am thankful for this opportunity that um, you have blessed me with to be able to share a message from your Holy Word. You could have called anyone, but today, this moment, this, this hour, you have called me for such a time as this. So, Father, I just, I pray over these words that you would just open the eyes of our hearts wherever we may be in relationship with you. Maybe we are seeking, Father, maybe we are passionately in love with you, but maybe, maybe the fire has grown cold. So, Holy Spirit, would you just fan the flames of those who are in this room, of those who are watching online? It's a prayer. I don't pray it often, but I probably should. God, would you comfort the afflicted? But if necessary, afflict the comfortable today. Lord, speak through me. If not through me, in spite of me, so that your will and your words would be heard. And Lord, at the end of the day, if people are saying my name, then I failed. At the end of the day, at the end of this message, may you, may you be given all the glory. May you be given all the honor and all the praise. And it's in the name of Jesus that we say, amen, amen. It was 1998, and um, I had been a youth director. Um, I entered into ministry. I was a youth director uh, over 25 years ago. 1996 was when I started. And uh, the first year of youth ministry, I took a group of young people. We did a a mission project, a border project in Matamoros, Mexico. But the following year, um, a couple years later, 98, we we did an inner-city mission trip, and we went to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I was there, a couple youth workers were with me, a bunch of youth, and about midway through that trip, 
there was, a, um, there was a van that was waiting in front of this place that we were staying. We literally, where we did mission work, Rocky, you see, like Rocky 1. Where, where Rocky trained, like where Rocky lived, that was the neighborhood that we did mission work in. And on Wednesday, there was a van that was waiting, and they took us to a park in inner city Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Now, I'm not going to lie, it was a scary park. And it was the daytime. I don't even know what it was like at night. But we got out of the van, and the leaders, those who were leading this mission trip, they said, here's two things that we want you to do for the next four hours. The very first thing we want you to do is we want you to pray. We want you to just pray. Ask the Holy Spirit. Who is, who is the Lord leading you to? Who has God placed in your path that might need a word of encouragement, that might need to enter into a life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ? First thing, you just pray. You ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes to someone who needs the words of Jesus that's in front of you. And after you pray, this was equally as, impor equally as important, move towards them. Go, be bold, and then just pray. Seems pretty simple, right? So we got out of the van, we started, check number one, okay, pray, we asked the Holy Spirit, Lord, would you guide us to the one that needs some hope? After we were finished, we said, all right, Lord, who are you leading us to? Now, enter into the story a youth worker named Harold. <laughs> I think every youth ministry needs a Harold. I think our youth ministry has a Harold. Harold was about 70 years old, but inside, he was around 15, Harold had this contagious love for Jesus. He loved young people. Harold, he drove most of the way to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He wanted to, and I let him. And we got there, and Harold, after we finished praying, I said, all right, who's the Lord leading us to? Harold was the first one to speak up, and he said, I think the Holy Spirit is leading us to that guy right there. Now, we all turned and looked. Now, let me tell you about that guy over there. He was sitting in a park bench. Now, he was partially looking away from us. And I'm, I'm going to be honest, I judged. I have never seen so many tattoos on a human body in my entire life. There were things that were written on his body that was somewhat offensive. There was a goat on his back. Not a, it wasn't goat yoga. Like literally a giant, ta I don't know why, a tattooed goat that was there. So Harold, of course, says the Holy Spirit, I just feel something over here. And then every, every, all the kids look at me like. <laughs> and here I am, your spiritual leader. And I look at Harold, and I go, you know, I'm feeling something over here. I just, it was true. It was as if I had a rain stick, and it was just like, ooh, over here. Well, when I looked in this direction, Harold, he didn't submit to authority. He just walked right over to this man and tapped him on the shoulder. Now, I'm in charge of these young people, so, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to leave my brother behind, so I kept a safe distance. I stood behind Harold as he tapped this man on the shoulder, and the gentleman turned around, and Harold said, hey, sorry to bother you. But we are, we're a part of a church group from Marshall, Texas. And, and we're just, uh, we're praying for people. We believe that Jesus is the light of the world and, and the hope of all humanity. And we just want to offer a prayer. Is there any way we can pray for you today? Now, there's a reason why this memory is right here inside my mind. I'm never going to forget it. Because there was something that happened in this moment that took my breath away, and it was his reaction. Because Harold was the one that engaged the conversation. Harold was the one that walked over. Harold was the one that tapped him on the shoulder. But when he responded, for some reason, he didn't look at Harold. He just looked straight into my eyes. And tears began to fill up his eyes. He said, I have to tell you something. I've had one of the worst days I've ever had. He said, when I was growing up, my mama used to pray over me. She was a believer. She would pray over me every day. But I feel like I've just turned into the prodigal son. I went so far away. But it wasn't that long ago that I actually fell on my knees. It wasn't that long ago that I confessed Jesus Christ as my Lord and personal Savior. But over the last 48 hours, I've made some decisions in my life that I feel like the Lord is done with me. I felt like the Lord was finished with me. I felt like the Lord had no place for me in his kingdom anymore. So I said a prayer on this bench this morning. And I said, God, if you're still full 
for me? Would you let me know? Because I'm giving up hope. I don't think there's a place for me. And he looks me square in the eyes and he says, you were the answer to a prayer that just came off of my lips. Thank you. Man. And you know, <laughs> conviction, conviction is a funny thing. We don't know what to do with conviction. Sometimes we take conviction when the Spirit convicts us and, and we think that, that maybe God's condemning us. We think conviction is a bad thing, but I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, conviction is a gift. It is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Conviction is the Holy Spirit saying to you, oh, now you're catching up. Now you know. Conviction is the Holy Spirit just saying, come on, we got more work to do. See, the truth is, I judged. I did. I think about that moment, right, with Samuel where, where he's going to, to anoint the new king of Israel. It's David, but he's not a king. He's just a shepherd boy, remember? And Samuel goes and all of David's brothers line up and God's like, not that one, not that one, not that one. And then the Lord teaches Samuel an important lesson that we sometimes forget. He says this, he says, listen, God says, man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord sees the heart. The Lord sees the heart. So I have to ask the question, where are we looking over those that may be sitting in benches? Where are we missing the opportunities, the people that God has placed in our path? Where are we allowing fear to become a blocker when it comes to taking the good news of Jesus into the world? And that's why I go back to Numbers chapter 14. Maybe you know the story. Right? Like God's people, the Israelites, they're wandering through the wilderness. It takes them a while to get to the promised land. Why? A couple reasons. One, they didn't have ways. There was no GPS. Google Maps wasn't around, right? But, you know, I say God is faithful. We want, I say this often, we want the God of Amazon Prime, right? Overnight and it's there. The Lord's a little more like the postal service. Takes some time, but he gets there, Right? So eventually, 40 years in, they reach the promised land. And what do they do? They send spies to go check it out. Well, the spies come back, and there's good news, and there's bad news. Why does there always have to be bad news? The good news, they report, it is a land that's flowing with milk and honey. And you can just hear the Israelites just go, yay! But here comes the bad news. Yeah, but there's... There's giants over there, and then there are hills. There are warriors, and there are weapons, and there are walls. And what happens? Discouragement and fear. It begins to spread. See, that's what the enemy does. He wants us to be overrun with discouragement. He wants us to be fearful. And what happens in the story? It's painful. Now, two voices speak up. Praise God for Joshua and Caleb. They had good mentors in their life. Joshua and Caleb were the ones raising their hands going, yeah, yeah, hold on. But if the Lord brought us to it, don't we trust him that he's going to bring us through it? They were the ones that were saying that. But this is hard. God took a generation and he looked at them that had been on that 40-year journey and he said, listen, because of your fear, because of your discouragement, you're going to miss out on a greater blessing. The next generation is going to go into the promised land. That's hard. But God is faithful. Next generation comes in. A couple other spies go into Jericho. Now, this is Joshua chapter 2. And this is when you meet Rahab. Now, Rahab, I just see her as that person on a bench. That God had her as an important part of her story. The question is, who is going to see her? And what I love about Rahab, why she came to my mind this week, is something that she says in Joshua chapter 2. Let me read it to you, right? A couple spies are there, and she's giving them shelter and refuge. She's a part of God's greater plan, an unlikely suspect that you never would have thought God would have. Wait, really? Here's what she says. I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us. So that all who live in this country, they are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to Sion and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. And when we heard of it, our hearts melted in, say that word out loud, fear. And everyone's courage failed. 
because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now, here's what's interesting. A generation missed the opportunity to walk into a land that was promised for them. Why? Because they feared their neighbors. The Israelites, their perception had been wrong. They feared their neighbors when the truth is their neighbors actually had a greater fear of God, had a greater understanding of the power of God than that current generation had of their own heavenly father. And Rahab was there to say, oh, we knew who you were. And Rahab became an important part of God's story. It was the next generation that would figure that out. Isn't that incredible? And what I love about Rahab, what I love about her story is you find her, her name comes up a couple times in the New Testament. You know this. Hebrews chapter 11, like I, I love Hebrews 11. It's known as the faith chapter, right? By faith, Abraham. By faith, Moses. By faith, Noah. Here's all these, um, these pillars of the faith that had this incredible faith. Well, guess who you find in the faith chapter? By faith, Rahab. Isn't that incredible? But my favorite place where you find Rahab's name, <laughs> very beginning of the New Testament, go to Matthew chapter 1. Why don't you take a look later at the genealogy of Jesus? This is so good. Right there. Matthew, a tax collector, who is he to even be seen by Jesus? I don't think it's an accident that in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, you find some messy stories, some messy people, some people who had real sin and stain on their life. But what a joy to know that Jesus came out of the mess of this world to redeem the world and to save us from the sin, the chains that bind. See, here's what I know. Here's what I know. In Matthew chapter 9, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus says this incredible thing. I love it. He says, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to raise up workers and to go out into his harvest field. It gave me such joy and great delight a week ago. If, if you go out those doors and you, you hook a left and you go all the way down to the end of the hall, there's, there's another little worshiping community known as the Harvest. I don't know if you've heard of them, but <clears throat> here, here's what your senior pastor said last week. I got to look at this community that I love and say, hey, guess what? You're not the harvest. You think, you think you're the harvest. You're not the harvest. See, the harvest is actually beyond the walls. The harvest is actually beyond the walls of this church. What Jesus is saying is the Holy Spirit is faithful. That he is tilling up the soil all around us. But here's what the Lord is asking for. He says, pray that the Lord of the harvest would raise up workers to go into his harvest field. Note, he doesn't say spectators. He doesn't say pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would just raise up a bunch of spectators who are going to watch other, no, 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 workers to go out into the harvest field. Let me tell you what I want to do for our future here at the Woodlands Methodist Church is I, 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 want, us to get, I want us to get spiritually fit. I want us to get spiritually in shape. I want to see an army of workers ready to go out into the harvest field because there are people that are lost. There are people that maybe they found Jesus, but they've wandered. Maybe the world is leading them in a different direction. Do we care? And what are we going to do? Now, that takes me to 1 Peter chapter 3. Now, here's what's happening in 1 Peter, right? I have to be true to the text and the context of what's happening. Now, 1 Peter, Peter is writing to the church somewhere between 60 and 65 AD. So the church is pretty young. Now, what's also happening is persecution is very real. 
So when he is talking to the church and he says things like, now listen, don't, don't be fearful if you suffer. Like they're, they're hearing this and this is a balm on their soul. Why? Because if they say the name Jesus, the odds are they are going to die because of the stance that they take professing Jesus Christ as Lord. That was the reality then. And by the way, I would be remiss to not bring this up. You know this is still happening today. You know there are men and women that are putting themselves in harm's way. I have family members right now. I can't even tell you where they are or what they're doing, but I'll tell you this. They are on a mission. They are helping to establish a business, but if they say the name Jesus out loud, persecution is there for them as well. There are underground missionaries that are doing an incredible work in putting their life on the line God, please don't let us forget to pray for those men and women that are putting themselves in harm's way because they're living out the Great Commission. Now, here's the thing. The context for us today is a little different in this country, right? I mean, I can say that. We have an incredible freedom. I mean, I, I, I'm here. There is a microphone. We are online. Like, I, I can tell people about Jesus and the odds of me losing my life for it, not that great. However, persecution for us in this country as followers of Jesus who adhere to his word, it's going to look a little different. It's going to mean that we may not be quite as popular as we used to be. When you take the red letters at face value and you live it out, you, you, you may lose people in your social circle because they're going in a direction that is counter to where the gospel is calling us to go. And Jesus never misled us. If, if, if the path, if the gate is narrow, then we have to understand like persecution, we just, we may not be as popular. Here, you may lose Facebook friends. Do you know, like we laugh, but like, do you know this? Like, I'll tell you this. I've been on Facebook ever since it started. When I was in youth ministry, college ministry, I had Facebook. Well, a couple of years ago, this terrible thing happened. I hit 5,000 friends on Facebook. That's a wall. Did you know that? I didn't write it. But if you hit 5,000 friends, you, like if you friend request me and I have 5,000 friends, it'll say, I'm so sorry. Mark has too many friends. He can't be your friend. That's terrible. I feel bad about that. But here's, here's where this kind of messed me up a little bit. This is true. Like Sunday afternoons, I, I, I'll, you know, preach. The, the best nap, by the way, I take all week long is Sunday afternoon around 2 o'clock. I just crawl under that anxiety blanket, and I have just a sweet, sweet sleep. But I will get on my, my phone. I will look at Facebook. This has happened many times. And I'll look. Not that I check it out. I wish I didn't know. But I'll see Mark has 4,991 friends. And I will say, was the sermon that bad? <laughs> that nine people would go through the effort of unfriending. It's just crazy, right? Like the truth is, it's still going to be challenging. We have to know we're going to be countercultural. But what Peter says to the church in 60 AD, the encouragement that he would breathe into them, I still think there's encouragement here for us. And I define it this way. I simplified it a little bit. Five things, cheer up, give up, lift up, speak up, and shape up. Now, here's what I'm talking about. First, let's start here. Cheer up. Because Peter says this. He says, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. You're blessed. Now, someone right now, you may be struggling. Someone right now, you may be hurting. Someone right now, maybe there is a relationship that's just skewed, that's torn. First, wherever you are, what a great thing to remember. You are blessed. We are blessed. Why? Because nothing separates us from the love of our Heavenly Father. We are blessed because God so loved the world that He came. Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So it's not if you suffer, when you suffer, start here. You're blessed because God has not left you. God is not a distant God. 
We socially distance from one another, and rightfully so. God has never socially distanced from you, no matter what kind of germ, bug, sin, stain you have in your life. We are blessed. Remember the words of Jesus. How do you start a sermon? You've got to have a good hook. That's what they taught us in it's what they taught us in seminary. Capture their attention. Well, how's this for a sermon starter? Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount. Jesus comes out strong with, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Or chapter or verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I love that Peter starts with this, cheer up, you're blessed. But on the other side of cheer up, there's this give up. Give up. And that doesn't mean just give it up, throw in the towel. It means this. He says, do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. You need to give up fear. You have to release the fear that is keeping you from advancing the good news of the gospel. If there's something you should know about me, it's that I don't use a lot of hair gel. That's ADHD and it's anxiety. I have had, true story, I have struggled with anxiety for a majority of my life, which is why, I don't know, it had to be the Holy Spirit, senior pastor. Well, that sounds great. Matthew 28, 19, and 20, close to my heart. But when you're talking about giving up fear, (laughs) Philippians 4, 4 through 8 has been a gift to me for a long time. Paul says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, through prayer, petition, thanksgiving, supplication, you lay those requests at the feet of Jesus. And here's the thing, the peace of God that passes all understanding, it will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Peter is saying to the early persecuted church, listen, You need to know that you're blessed, and on the other side of the blessing, you just need to lay down that fear, and you need to trust that God is in control. And what's next? It's this lift up. This. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. On the other side of the blessing, on the other side of laying down fear, you raise the banner that Jesus is Lord over your life. When we say Jesus is Lord, do we understand what we're saying? I love a commentator wrote this, too good to not share with you. He said, only Christ matters. In light of eternity, could anything in the world matter more than Jesus Christ? Since this world is passing away, nothing we do or say, Nothing we achieve, nothing we own, no fortune we amass, no empire we build, none of it matters at all compared to our Lord. Only Christ matters. We need to hear this. We need to repeat this. We need to preach it and teach it to our children. We will never be ready for suffering until we lift Christ up and we set him apart as Lord of all Someone wants to say amen. (laughs) Jesus is Lord. We hold the banner up. But on the other side of that, here it comes. Speak up. Speak up. Peter doesn't hold back. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Give an answer, that word answer. Maybe your translation says defense. Be prepared to give a defense. That Greek word is apologia. It doesn't mean we apologize for Jesus in our life. It means that apologetics... It means that we have such a knowledge of Jesus that we are ready to tell people about the hope that we have. And by the way, what Peter is saying is, listen, be prepared, but this, don't miss this. Always be prepared to give a response for the hope in which you have. What Peter's saying here is, listen, you should be living in such a way that people think you're crazy. Like, you should have such a hope 
and such a joy in your life in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of divisiveness, in the midst of the darkest seasons we've ever seen, there should be a bounce in your step and a joy in your heart that people are coming to you saying, you got something in you? Hey, whatever you got, whatever you're taking, whatever you're drinking, could you tell me what do you have going on in you? There it is. Are you ready? Here's the response. Oh, that's just Jesus. Let me tell you why I have hope. Let me tell you why I'm smiling right now. Because Jesus is Lord of all. Because God has not given up on humanity. Let me tell you about where my hope comes from. We need to be prepared to speak up. But on the other side of speaking up, I'm wrapping up. <laughs> we got we to gotta shape up. We got to shape up. We got to shape up. This was convicting for me. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience. Can I ask you something? How are we doing with being gentle and respectful with one another? How are we doing when it comes to treating people with gentleness and respect, not just the non-believers, but one another? I, I mean, my, my heart this week, the conviction that I have this week <laughs> is my prayer. I, I just, I wish we could be as passionate about seeing the lost come to Jesus as we are, about the divisiveness and the social issues that we seem to be so passionate about, so, so angry about. I wish we could be as passionate about seeing the lost come to Jesus because that's who we're called to be. God, forgive us for losing our focus. God, forgive us for focusing on the small when you have called us to keep our eyes on the great commission. May it be our great obsession. I'll close, I'll close with this story. I think, I know, God has gifts. God is just putting things in our path. He is just ready to just surprise us every day. The question is, are, are we looking? And I just got an incredible email this week. It was such a gift. It was a, a friend, Mary, and she, she shared with me a dream, a vision that she had earlier this week. And she said, I just thought you need to know. I had this dream, and in this dream, I, I was standing in this, in this yard. There was a vast field, and there, was, there, were, there were prison bars that were in front of me. And she said, on the other side of those prison bars... There were all different generations and they were just walking and they seemed to be happy, but she said they were in prison and they didn't have any idea. They had no idea of the bondage and the captivity that they were in. And she said, in front of me, there was a prison door and it had a lock on it. And I looked down and she said, I saw in my hand, I had a key. So I walked over to the door, I unlocked the door, I opened it, and I just began to shout these words, come to Jesus, come to Jesus. And she said, as I did, I looked and Jesus was next to me, and he was taking people by the hand, and he was leading them out of their prison cell. And then she said, I woke up. And she said, I have to tell you, this is why I'm sharing this with you, because this is what this Great Commission series has done to me. It's waking me up in the middle of the night. It's reminding me that there are hopeless people. There are lost people. But we have been given a powerful key in the name of Jesus Christ. So my prayer for us as the children of God is that we would be bold with that key. That we would move beyond fear and we would step into faith and we would speak up. We would shout the name of Jesus and may God be given the glory, the praise. And it's in the name of Jesus that we say amen and amen. Amen. Let me pray over us right now. Gracious and loving God, I'm thankful for these words. 
Lord, I'm thankful. I just sense the Holy Spirit. God, someone right now is coming alive. There is a life. There is a face that someone has been praying for, that Jesus would would interrupt their life. And God, someone right now, I don't know who they are, whether they're in this space or they're online, but they know they're the person that they've been praying for. They know that they're the one, that Jesus, you're saying, go, you have that ticket, you have that key, go, be bold, tell them about who I am, tell them where hope can come. So Father, for what you've done, we look back and we thank you for what you're doing. God, may you be given the praise and for what you have in store, may you be given the honor. Thank you, Jesus. It's in the name of Jesus that we say, amen.